So now we're going to discuss pain management um, in chapter 24 of your text. So try to answer this question, what is pain? And then why is it important to effectively treat patients' pains? Well, the classic definition is pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, existing whenever he says it does. Nurses are legally and ethically responsible for managing pain and relieving suffering. The Joint Commission Pain Standard requires healthcare providers to assess all patients for pain on a regular basis. Healthcare, many healthcare institutions have added pain to the fifth vital sign. An unpleasant subjective sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Pain is purely subjective. No two people experience pain in the same way and no two painful events create identical responses or feelings in a person. Always remember that the patient is the one who is experiencing pain. Therefore, pain is whatever the, per the patient says it is. It is not the responsibility of patients to prove that they are in pain. It is a nurse's responsibility to accept their report. Effective pain management improves quality of life, reduces physical discomfort, promotes earlier mobilization and return to previous baseline functional activity levels, results in, a, in fewer hospitals and clinic visits and pain management also decreases hospital length of stay, resulting in lower healthcare costs. There are four physiological processes of normal pain, transduction, transmission, perception, modulation. Transduction begins in the periphery when a pain producing stimulus, such as exposure to pressure or a hot surface, sends an impulse across a sensory peripheral nerve pain fiber initiating an action potential. Once transduction is complete, transmission of the pain impulse begins. The neurotransmitters affect the sending of nerve stimuli. During transmission, excitatory neurotransmitters send electrical impulses across the synaptic cleft between the two fibers, enhancing transmission of the pain impulse. These pain sensitizing substances around the pain fibers in the extracellular fluid, spreading the pain message and causing an inflammatory response. Nerve impulses resulting from the painful stimulus travel along afferent peripheral nerve fibers. The pain impulses travel up the spinal cord and to the higher centers of the brain. Once a pain stimulus reaches the cere cerebral cortex, the brain interprets the quality of the pain and processes information from past experiences, knowledge, and cultural associations in the perception of the pain. Perception is the joint, is the point at which a person is aware of pain. The reaction to pain includes the physiological and behavioral response that occur after an individual an individual receives the pain. Once the brain perceives pain, there is a release of inhibitory neurotransmitters such as endorphins, serotonin, and norepinephrine, which hinder the transmission of pain and help produce an analgesic effect. These inhibitory neuromodulators are present in higher levels in people who have less pain than others with a similar injury. A protective reflex response also occurs with pain reception. Motor impulses travel via a reflex arc along motor nerve fibers back to a peripheral muscle, muscle near the site of stimulation, bypassing the brain. Contraction of the muscle leads to a protective withdrawal from the source of pain. Pain processes require an intact nervous system and spinal cord. Common factors that disrupt the pain process include trauma, drugs, tumor growth, 
and metabolic disorders. See Table 44-1 on page 1017. Simulation of the synaptic branch of the autonomic nervous system results in physiological responses. Fight or flight response, which is increased blood pressure and heart rate, dilation of pupils, and diaphoresis. Sustained physiological responses to pain sometimes seriously harm individuals, except in cases of severe traumatic pain, which causes a person to go into shock. Most people adapt to their pain and their physical signs return to normal baseline. Patients in pain do not always have changes in their vital signs. Be familiar with behavioral responses to pain, clenching the teeth, facial grimacing, holding on, guarding the painful part, and bent posture are, are all common indications of acute pain. Chronic pain affects a person's activity. Eating, sleeping, socialization, thinking affects can make them confused, forgetful, or emotionally they can become angry, they may have depression, irritability, and then it's just an overall decrease in the quality of life and productivity. Lack of pain expression does not indicate that a person is now is not experiencing pain. Some patients choose not to report pain if they believe that it inconveniences others or if it signals loss of self-control. A person's culture also can affect how they respond to pain or react to pain. Is pain always a bad thing? Well, no. It does warn people of an injury or disease. Acute pain can threaten a patient's recovery by resulting in prolonged hospitalization, complications from immobility, or delayed rehabilitation. Acute pain seriously threatens a patient's recovery by hampering the patient's ability to become active and involved in self-help care. Teaching won't be effective if a patient is focused on their pain. A primary nursing goal is to include pain relief that allows patients to participate in their recovery to prevent complications and improve functional status. Chronic pain lasts longer than expected, usually at least six months. It does not always have to be an identifiable cause to the pain. Unrelieved acute pain can progress to chronic pain. What are some examples of chronic pain? That would be like arthritis, hairy, headaches or migraines, peripheral neuropathy, or back, back pain. The possible unknown cause of chronic pain frequently leads to psychological depression and even suicide. Symptoms of chronic pain would be fatigue, insomnia, anorexia, weight loss, hopelessness, and depression. Patients with chronic pain should receive pain medication around the clock, not PRN. Nociceptive pain involves nerves respond appropriate to a painful stimulus. So somatic pain involves stimulation or receptors in the skin, muscles, joints, and tendons, usually localized, describing as throbbing or aching. Visceral pain involves uh, internal organs often poorly localized, may be referred pain as well. Neuropathic pain due to damage in the nervous system is described as burning, sharp, numbing, like an electric shock. You may hear uh, your patients complain of that. When there is no obvious source of pain, um, like our patients with chronic lower back pain, um, or neuropathies even. The patient is sometimes labeled as a pain seeker, which is disturbing. Studies of nurses' attitudes regarding pain management show that a nurse's personal opinion about a patient's report of pain affects pain assessment and titration of opioid doses. The amount, the amount of analgesia administered may vary based on whether a patient is grimacing or smiling during the nurse's assessment. Page 1019, go there and review box 44-2. It's called 
biases and misconceptions about pain. Very important to go and take a look at that. Age-related changes and increased frailty may lead to a less predictable response to analgesic, increased sensitivity to medications and potential harmful drug effects. Pain is not an inevitable part of aging. So we need to make sure that our patients don't think just because they're getting older that they should be in pain. Page 1020, go there and review that table 44-3 and 44-4. Each person learns from painful experiences. When a patient has no experience with a painful condition, the first perception of pain often impairs the ability to cope. Spirituality, consider making a referral to pastoral care for patients in pain. Anxiety often increases the perception of pain and pain causes feelings of anxiety. It's difficult to separate the two sensations. Pain is a lonely experience that often causes patients to feel a sense of loss of control. Coping style influences the ability to deal with the pain. Cultural beliefs and values affect how individuals cope with pain, including how they react and express pain. In some cultures, expression of pain is unacceptable or a sign of weakness. So don't assume patients will report pain when they have it. You need to actually ask them. Okay, this slide talks about your pain assessment. You're gonna to need to know this for um, lecture as well as simulation as well as clinical. Um, and you can read here the PQRST. This is what they stand for, the palliative or provocative. So what makes your pain worse, a position change, et cetera? Um, what's the quality of, of pain? So it's here, it, the question is, how do you describe your pain? You need to give them that freedom to explain exactly what it feels like. And then ask about the region or radiation, um, severity of the symptoms. This is when we ask them that pain scale. Um, timing. Is your pain intermittent or is it constant? Does it come and go? You know, when did it start? Pain is often under-recognized, misunderstood, and inadequately treated. If patients have are having difficulty expressing pain, this does not mean that they are not in pain. When a patient is unable to communicate pain, it's especially important for you to be alert for behaviors that indicate pain. Patients with cognitive impairments often require insightful assessment approaches involving close observation of vocal response, facial movements, body movements. Is the patient moaning, crying, grimacing? Clenched teeth even can mean that they're in pain. Patients who are critically ill and have a clouded sensorium or the presence of nasogastric tubes or artificial airways that's going to prevent them from communicating with us. And we can use some of these other scales to communicate with these patients about their pain. Again, here's that slide that has nursing diagnosis related to acute or chronic pain. So just make sure that you hold this aside um, so that if you have a patient in pain in your simulation or in your clinical, you'll know that these apply. In the planning phase, um, you know, this is when we're managing pain, where goals are of care promote a patient's optimal functioning. We want them to be at that optimum level um, for themselves. In the case of acute pain, non-pharmacological measures should never be used in place of pharmacologic therapies. Cognitive and behavior interventions change patients' perceptions of pain after pain behavior, ultra pain behavior, and provide patients with a greater sense of control, which is important. Examples are like distractions. Um, prayer, guided imagery, biofeedback and music. These are all things that we can use these days um, to help our patients deal with pain. Music therapy, by the way, uh, may be useful in treating acute or chronic pain. It can treat stress, it can treat anxiety and depression. Um, for the cold and heat applications, uh, they can relieve pain and promote healing. 
Avoid injury to the skin though by checking the temperature and not allowing the heat or cold directly to the skin. For cold therapy, by the way, limit application to five minutes of when the patient feels the numbness, okay? Um, also, application near the actual site of pain tends to work the best. And, you know, there are TENS units, and T-E-N-S, TENS units. Um, they help to reduce muscle tension, um, resulting in less pain as well. Encourage your patients to accept pain relieving measures uh, so they don't remain active. I'm sorry, so they remain active and continue to maintain daily activities. This is very important. I know some patients don't want to take it, um, but uh, it's there for pain control. Teach patients the importance also of reporting their pain sooner rather than later to facilitate better control and optimal functioning status. Analgesics are the most common and effective method of pain relief. There are three types of analgesics, okay? The non-opioids, uh, these include acetaminophen, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, or NSAIDs you might hear called, uh, like aspirin, ibuprofen, okay? The second um, analgesic is opioids. Um, you may have heard these referred to as narcotics. And then three are adjuvants. A, um, and these are medications that aren't normally prescribed for pain, for pain but they help to um, kind of help out the other um, analgesics. For instance, if um, maybe um, the patient that's in pain may be prescribed an opioid, but then to help with that opioid, um, maybe they prescribe like a tricyclic antidepressant. So um, they're not used for pain typically, but they can help with the pain response, okay? Non-opioids include acetaminophen, NSAIDs, like we talked about before. Acetaminophen, though, be careful because we know that they can um, get hepatic toxicity. So we need to limit um, acetaminophen daily to four grams, okay, for, for adults, of course. And um, insets, just so you have in the back of your mind that it's not recommended for older patients, um, more frequent adverse effects are GI bleed and renal insufficiency, so we don't want to give these to our patients. A uh, couple of pages I want you to take a look at are 1036, that box 44-13, those are common opioid side effects you'll need to know. And then also um, box 44-14, it talks about nursing principles of administering analgesics. Okay, so make sure you know that. When you convert a patient to an IV, to an, from an IV, sorry, to an oral form of the same opioid, understand that the dose of the oral opioid is usually much higher than the IV dose because of the first pass effect. Okay. Also, opioids are usually necessary and effective for acute pain and cancer pain of moderate to severe intensity. Systemic patient controlled analgesia or PCA traditionally involves IV or subcutaneous drug administration. However, a controlled analgesia device for oral medications is available. This device allows patients access to their own oral PRN medications, including opioids and other analgesics. So what we're saying here is that this PCA can be used with IV meds, okay? But also they have them where they will dispense the PO meds, okay? They have lockouts. There are several benefits to P PCA use. The patient gains control over the med and pain relief does not depend on the nurse's availability. So the patient can get it even if the nurse um, is busy and can't get by. Always teach though, explain that the pump reduces the risk for overdose because that's one of your typical fears for these patients um, and have the patient demonstrate use. Only patient, 
is to press the button. Please let the family and the friends know that they are not to operate the pump. So analgesics may come in topical form like creams, ointments, or patches. Okay, and then a local anesthesia, you know, that would be like maybe lidocaine. Um, if you have something, a skin lesion that's going to be removed, they would inject lidocaine for that local anesthesia. Okay, and then regional, when we talk about regional anesthesia, that would be like a nerve block, okay? Um, it's the injection or infusion of that local anesthetics to block a group of sensory fibers. Um, motor activity, though, remember this. When you're using a regional, um, motor activity is going to return before sensation. So what's going to happen is they'll be able to move it before they can feel it, and this can cause your patient to um, you know, be injured. And then this um, slide talks about epidural analgesic um, pain control. We want to make sure to reduce the risk of accidental epidural injection of drugs intended for IV use. Make sure that you clearly label the catheter epidural, um, the epidural catheter, because we need to know that it is going into um, a place where um, we're not going to inject something accidentally. So make sure you understand where those lines are going. So this slide, um, it, it's actually the World Health Organization. We've been hearing a lot about them lately, but they are the ones that recommend a three-step approach, um, or it's often termed the analgesic ladder for the management of cancer pain. This is very important to know. So treatments, you see on the step ladder, treatment begins with the NSAIDs and, um, and may add adjuvants, and um, it progresses all the way up to opioids. This three-step approach has been used worldwide and has been praised for its simplicity and ease of use. However, the latter has been the object of criticism as well. Make sure you go and review box 44-18, which is barriers to effective pain management. Um, it's very, very important that you do that. So lack of knowledge and misconception about pain and appropriate pain management presents significant barriers. Patients and healthcare providers often do not understand the differences between physical dependence, addiction, and drug tolerance. You'll get a lot of questions about this. Um, so that, you know, you can reinforce it with your patients. Experiencing a physical dependency does not imply addiction, okay? And drug tolerance in and of itself is not the same as addiction. There are many different definitions and interpretations of the terms placebo and placebo effect as well. I'm sure you've probably heard this term. Make sure that the only time you can give a placebo, make sure that you are um, involved in research and that patient knows that they're receiving that placebo. We cannot just give our patients what we term placebos, okay? For patients with chronic pain, the effect of pain intervention on the patient's function should be considered when evaluating the patient's perception of his or her response to treatment. If patients state that an intervention is not helpful or even aggravates the discomfort, stop it immediately and seek an alternative. Also, evaluating the effective effectiveness of pain intervention requires you to evaluate for change in the severity and quality of the pain. Also, be sure to evaluate after an appropriate period of time. Ask a patient of a medication if the medication alleviates the pain when it's peaking. Um, know that oral medications, you can check back with them in an hour. That's when it should have been effective. If we're doing IV push medications for um, this pain, you can check back within 15 to 30 minutes to make sure that that's worked. When a smiling and cooperative patient complains of discomfort, 
Nurses caring for this patient often harbor misconceptions about the patient's pain. Which of the following is true? It is number two, patients are the best judges of their pain. A patient has just undergone an appendectomy. When discussing with the patient several pain relief interventions, the most appropriate recommendation would be, it is number four, PCA pain management for that surgery patient. A post-operative patient is using PCA. You will evaluate the effectiveness of the medication when it is number one. You compare assessed pain with baseline pain.